Hello, I'm Dr. Corey Gill. I'm one of the pediatric orthopedic surgeons here at Scottish Rite Hospital. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm gonna to talk about something that's very common that for all of you who either treat children in your practice or have kids as parents, this is something that you've probably seen before. And so that's, we're gonna talk about in-towing, out-towing, and crooked legs. You know, how do we treat these things? And when should you be concerned? When do they need to see an orthopedic uh, surgeon for more evaluation? I have nothing to disclose. And as an overview, first I'm gonna talk a little bit about the physical exam. And then as we get into the specific conditions, we'll talk in more detail about those examination uh, tips and tricks. Uh, and then I'm basically going to divide it up into two big categories. So we have rotational deformities, meaning that there's a, a twisting usually within the bone itself, and that can really come anywhere from the hip all the way down. And we're going to be really talking about, again, legs today, not arms. Um, so those rotational deformities can make you in-toe or out-toe. And then our other big category that we're going to talk about are the angular deformities, so things that make you either uh, knock kneed, which is genu valgum, or bow legged, which is genu verum. So, again, first we're going to talk a little bit about the physical examination. This is a neat little uh, tool that I really like that comes out of our pediatric orthopedic textbook uh, that just talks about a quick kind of rule out examination. So, there's a lot of information that you can get just from watching, watching a kid move around. And so, if you just kind of watch them get onto and off of the table, walk back and forth, hop up and down, walk on their heels and their toes, and squat down, and, and usually I have them kind of jump as high as they can. You can really get a good idea of their overall uh, condition and rule out a lot of these things that we worry about as pediatric orthopedic surgeons. And then I won't go through all of these in detail, but on the left, you know, just for your reference and looking back through this, this talk, uh, and some of the things that we kind of look at in big categories that if you're kind of going through these and checking them off, you can get a, usually a pretty good idea of what's, what's going on. So I also want to spend a little bit of time talking about the specific kind of ages in terms of, of, uh, of, of tips and tricks when you're looking at specific age groups in an orthopedic exam. Uh, when we're talking about our infants and our toddlers, you know, we'd like them to look like this little baby in the bottom left, but oftentimes you get more of this uh, child that's in the top left, especially when they get into that stranger danger kind of age. Uh, so there's, there's definitely things you can do to help because it is key to have a relaxed, calm child to get as good a, an examination as you possibly can. So in babies, oftentimes turning the lights down, uh, sometimes playing some, some music, or kids that are a little bit older, letting them kind of stay in mom or dad's lap really helps them kind of be calm and helps you get a better examination. Yeah, it's always a good idea to get some basic, you know, checking heights, weights, head circumference, uh, things that can help you rule out, you know, uh, bigger problems or more systemic uh, conditions. You're looking at their face, you're looking at their uh, fingers and toes and neck and looking at if there's any differences from side to side. It's very important to do a hip examination in every baby that comes into your office. Uh, and it's unfortunately, hip dysplasia is quite common and sometimes it's missed. I had one even last week, a kid that came in to look at their foot and their hip was able to pop in and out of the socket. So it's always something you, you wanna check because you don't wanna miss it. As kids get a little bit older, you know, you, if you want to watch them walk, they rarely wanna walk towards you as the doctor. But if you borrow the child and, and have, hold on to them and set them down, they usually will very quickly move back over to the parent because as the doctor, you're a big scary monster like in this top right picture. And then, you know, as much as uh, electronics can, can sometimes be not the most beneficial thing for, for young children if there's too much screen time, they're really, you know, your friends in the doctor's office because if a kid can calm down by looking at the phone or a video on YouTube or the iPad, then it really makes them relax and let you really get a lot better exam. So that's, that's very helpful. As a kid gets a little bit older and they're able to cooperate a little bit better, it's a little bit easier, but it's important to really take your time. I always 
or never underestimate just talking to the kid, you know, giving them a high five or a fist bump, you know, something to kind of uh, break the ice or talking to them to let them kind of calm down and realize that you're, you're not scary or you're going to hurt them. That makes it a little bit easier to kind of then get the subsequent exam. Uh, I always like to sit on the, on the examining stool so you can really get down to the level of the child. And you, can, you can watch them move around and you can see things at their level. You have to be able to see their legs. You know, if a kid's wearing sweatpants um, or big baggy clothes and you can't see their legs, then you can't do a great exam. So you either need to have them wear shorts or uh, roll their pants or shorts up, but you have to be able to see their legs to be able to get a great exam. And then I always, if you have the ability to have an area somewhere in your office where the kid can really move, you know, it's not, there's not, it's hard to see some of the things that we like to see um, walking two or three feet. So if you can open the door, go out into the hallway, have a longer area where you can really see the child walk or ideally even run, then it makes it uh, a lot better examination. And then always kind of look as they're coming back into the room after doing that. You kind of watch how they climb up onto the exam table. It gives you a good idea of their coordination and how, their, how all of their muscles are working. So we're going to talk a lot about rotational alignment today. Um, but here are some of the, the biggest things that I look at in every kid when I'm looking at rotational alignment. So foot progression angle is this top picture. And it just means if you imagine a straight line down the area that someone's walking, what's the angle that their foot is. Is it pointing in? Is it pointed out? Is it pointing straight ahead? Um, are they in towing or are they out towing? So then in terms of looking at rotation of specific segments, the thigh section in the hip, the lower leg and the foot, I usually do this by having the child lie prone on the exam table. You can check hip internal and external rotation. It's often confusing. The foot turning out is actually hip internal rotation and turning in is external rotation. Um, it's important when you're doing that to make sure that the pelvis uh, at the posterior iliac crest of the child stays level because if you start moving the leg and they're moving their pelvis around, that doesn't give you an accurate assessment of how much rotation they have. And if you need to kind of keep them still, you can oftentimes put one hand just on their lower back to kind of keep their pelvis from moving. And then the thigh foot angle is this picture B here. And basically what you do for that is you want to make sure they're laying down. You've got the knee bent to 90 degrees and the kneecap, the patella is pointing straight down into the table. And then you're just seeing at which angle the foot is relative to that, to the thigh. Okay. And then the last is your forefoot alignment. So this is going to be our metatarsus seductus we're going to talk about in a little bit. But it's, it's looking at the back of the foot compared to the front of the foot. And is there an angle there? Or another way to, to look at it and put it is, is if the lateral border of the foot, is it straight or is it curved or C-shaped? And then in terms of angular alignment, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You, again, you have to be able to see their legs. But then you're looking at, are, is the child bow-legged or are they knock-kneed or are they straight? And oftentimes, I think it's a great idea if you have the an electronic medical record that allows you to take pictures. Uh, I think it's great to take a picture of the lower extremity alignment that helps you really get a better idea of what it looks like and also helps you follow it over time to see if it's improving, if it's someone you're watching. And then I think the other big point here is to when you're looking at angular alignment, you really still need to understand rotationally what's going on. Because as in this child, if you have the, the segments rotated, it can fool you in terms of where your angular alignment is. So in this picture on the left, uh, the, uh, you can't really see the true angular deformity because of the rotation of the leg. So it's very important that you point the patellas straight ahead, as in this picture on the right, and that can really show you your true angular alignment. So we're going to move on to talking about our first big category, which is our rotational deformities, in-towing and out-towing. And the first point I want to make here is that there's a big range of normal. So this is a study from the 1980s where they took a lot of patients or, or normal subjects from infancy all the way up to late uh, to 70 plus years of age 
and measured their physical exam findings, their rotation. And you can see there's a big range of normal here. You can see that it changes over time, which is going to be the case for a lot of these rotational and angular alignment in young kids. But you can also see there's a big range of normal, these little, uh, all the, the open circles are, are kind of two standard deviations. Uh, but you can see, so this is using hip internal rotation as an example, but the range of normal at a given age is about 40 degrees different. Uh, so you really, you can have a kid that internally rotates their hip 20 degrees and a hip kid that internally rotates their hip 60 degrees and both of those things are normal. Um, and when we really start to worry about things, you really have to get outside this, this range of normal. And oftentimes, even if someone is a little bit outside the range of, of normal, it's still okay. You know, for example, uh, my hip internal rotation is a lot less than 20 degrees. I don't have any problems with my, with my hips. So rotational deformities, arguably this may be the, the most common reason for pediatric orthopedic referral. This is just really common. And we see kids, you know, every week that have concerns of either in towing or out towing. And the physical exam is really key to figuring out where this is coming from. There can be some habitual component to it, but a lot of times the deformity is structural, meaning there actually is some rotation within the bones themselves. Uh, and the good news is that surgery or even treatment, orthopedic treatment for that matter, is almost never needed. This is a condition uh, that tends to do very well except for some extreme cases. That being said, it's something that's very visible uh, to parents especially. And if a child has got their toes turned in a lot or turned out a lot, that something can be very concerning to them, understandably. And so education is really a big component of dealing with patients with in towing and out towing. And some of you may have seen this cartoon before. It's usually written as, as the father sees, as the child sees, and as the mom sees, left to right. You know, I switched it around a little bit. But, you know, when, when we're looking at rotational deformities in towing and out towing, this is a little bit how it feels, you know, sometimes. The child is, is, feels like, why am I even here at the doctor's office? I'm fine. We as physicians are a little bit more, you know, nervous, or at least we want to look at everything closely because there certainly are some conditions that require treatment and you don't want to miss those. But parents oftentimes, because they're seeing something so visible, they're understandably worried and they, they feel like this picture on the right. And it's our job to kind of help them understand and help them, uh, help them feel better and, and alleviate some of this anxiety because they oftentimes come in with misperceptions about what is going on. So, and some of those include you know, my three-year-old stripping and falling all the time. This has gotta be because of the intoing, but all toddlers are falling frequently. It's rare that that's because of the intoing itself. Uh, they think that if their kid keeps walking like this, they're going to get stuck that way forever. And we'll talk a little bit about natural history of how, how rotation uh, changes as, as children grow and age, and that's not the case either. Uh, bone structure can change up until around age 8 or 10, and, and the walking may even improve a little bit after that. This is going to cause my kid to have horrible joint problems. It definitely is not going to do that. Grandma, this is a very common one. Grandma or another older family member says, well, you know, they had to wear braces because they are, their toes turned in. And, and so grandma says that our kid needs to have them or they're going to be messed up. Don't actually do this, but actually the leg braces that grandma had to wear were probably a waste of time. People used to do this a lot because we thought that it made children better. Um, but actually, it was just natural history and time. Kids would get better on their own if, they're, if they in-towed or out-towed, despite the braces. So we don't really do this anymore. And then the other concern is that, you know, this in-towing is going to keep our, our kid from being a superstar. And that one is the one that's, that's pretty easy and actually kind of fun to, to dispel this misperception. So there's a couple of studies. This first one here um, looked at sprinters, high school sprinters, and looked at their uh, alignment and how they, how, they, how, they, how they walked and how they ran. 
And basically, they found that in towing sprinters, you know, that the ones that presumably were fast because they're sprinters on the high school team actually had more in towing than, than controls. And specifically, in the lower leg section between the knee and the ankle, they had internal tibial torsion to cause their bone structure was actually different and caused them to point in. Um, similarly, this is looking at a, a large SEC school and scholarship athletes. They had more in towing. So, you know, you can tell families, hey, I'm, you know, I, I see that your child may in tow a little bit more than, than other kids, but you know what, they, they, they may be faster. And then that usually parents are, are pretty happy with that. And they're coming in to your office worried and anxious, and then they're leaving the office, you know, understanding and realizing that this may actually make their, their kid faster. So that's, that's oftentimes quite rewarding. So in summary, especially in Texas, where football's king, and you got a bit of internal tibial torsion, usually equals pretty happy families. So that one's usually a pretty uh, easy misperception to, to deal with. So I mentioned that, that intoning is usually a structural deformity. It can come from the thigh section, it can come from the lower leg section, it can come from the foot. And the foot's metatarsus seductus. The lower leg is internal tibial torsion, and femoral anaversion is the thigh section. And interestingly, these usually kind of fit with certain age groups as well, with the, the foot, the metatarsus seductus being in infants, internal tibial torsion more in toddlers, and femoral anaversion is in more grade school kids. And we're going to talk about each one of these a little bit. So starting from the foot and then moving up, metatarsus seductus means the intoing is coming from the foot itself. Uh, this is something that kids are usually born with. Again, it usually, if you look at the outside border of the foot, rather than being in a straight line, which is what it should be, it's curved or C-shaped. And this is because the forefoot, the front part of the foot, is adducted on the rest of the foot, on the midfoot. So it's angled in a bit. And this is often thought to be a problem of intrauterine positioning, kind of a packing problem, we call them. It's important in these kids, in terms of kids that have kind of packing problems, can be associated with other things like hip dysplasia and torticollis. And so you want to always have your radar up a bit if a kid comes in with metatarsus seductus, that you're looking for these other things. Similarly, if a kid comes in for concern of hip dysplasia or torticollis, then I'm also looking at the feet to see if I see metatarsus seductus. It's oftentimes bilateral. Generally speaking, it's flexible. And the good news is that without even any treatment, the vast majority of these will get better over time on their own within the first one to three years of life. So this is a study, a long-term study of 30-year follow-up, uh, which, we, which we see sometimes in, in Iowa. There's several good studies out of, of that state because people tend to stay there for uh, various reasons, but they have some great long-term studies in looking at kids like this kid on the left with metatarsus seductus as an infant, and then again as an adult, and there's nothing there. So this does tend to get better over time without really doing anything most of the time. So in terms of our overall treatment recommendations for metatarsus seductus, usually we just watch it, especially if it's flexible because it tends to get better on its own. Oftentimes, when the family comes in with this concern, we talk about stretching, and I think maybe this helps it get better a little bit faster. I'm not sure that it changes the overall natural history, but it certainly doesn't hurt, and I think parents like to help stretch the foot a little bit, so I usually still do recommend this. Uh, sometimes we do cast these kids if it's uh, more of a rigid metatarsus seductus, meaning it can't fully correct, and it's staying that way. Usually, if it's still there between 6 and 12 months of age, then I'll go ahead and cast them, which is, looks fairly similar to a clubfoot cast. There's a bit of a debate whether you need to do short casts versus long casts that go up, up above the knee. Uh, both may work, um, but usually with these casts, you can stretch the foot out within a couple casts, and they don't generally require any bracing or anything afterwards like club feet do and the problem is, is fixed. And then surgery, I would say, is extremely rare in metatarsus seductus. 
It almost never is needed. If so, it usually involves cutting the bone and kind of reorienting the, the bones in the foot to make the foot straight, sometimes combined with soft tissue releases as well. So next, we're gonna talk about what's called internal tibial torsion, uh, meaning that there's inward twist of the lower leg section between the knee and the ankle. Um, and again, physical exam is very important. This is the one that's more common in our toddler age group, um, but it may be associated, or it is associated oftentimes with infantile blount disease or physiologic genuvarum. Kids that come in because they're bow-legged oftentimes have internal rotation of the tibia. Uh, the the bow-leggedness, as we'll talk about a little bit later, can certainly be a problem. However, the inward rotation, the internal tibial torsion in and of itself is not usually a big concern um, because it tends to get better on its own. Um, so the way we look at this, the best way I like to look at it is, is with what's called the thigh foot angle I mentioned briefly in the physical exam section. So again, as a reminder, you want to make sure the patella, the kneecap is pointed straight down into the bed. And then you bring the ankle to 90 degrees and you're looking at where the foot is pointed relative to the thigh. Uh, and if it's more internally rotated, if it's actually internally rotated more than the thigh, it's negative. If it's externally rotated a bit, then that's a positive number. And this it changes throughout childhood and gradually externally rotates over time. Uh, but after about mid-childhood, the average is about 10 degrees externally rotated. But again, there's like, like with hip internal rotation, there's a fairly big range of normal. So being pointed in 5 degrees to pointed out 30 degrees is kind of the normal range. So historically, as I mentioned, you know, oftentimes these kids were put into braces. Um, I would like to think that we've We've learned a bit over time, like this picture of Forrest Gump here, and as physicians, we, we try not to, to smoke cigarettes anymore, especially when we're, we're seeing patients. <laughs> um, and we don't need to put internal tibia torsion kids into braces. However, you'll still find many companies on Amazon uh, or on the internet that are willing to sell braces to try and, and cure intoing, and so families often ask about this, and so we just, educate them on why this is not needed. Uh, in some cases, when you have significant internal tibial torsion that's causing a functional problem, or uh, sometimes in, uh, if, if, and it's usually in severe cases, uh, then you can actually change it, but the only way to really change it is to, not with a brace, is to do surgery. So you either have to cut the bone and put a plate and screws on it, or you can cut the bone and put a frame on the outside and gradually correct it over time. You know, obviously these are both uh, big surgeries, so not something you wanna go into lightly. Again, fortunately, it's almost never needed for internal tibial torsion, but occasionally it is. We usually wait till at least around age 10 or so to do this because it's kind of changing over time and uh, you wanna see if it's gonna get better on its own. And also you worry a bit more that if you're doing a big surgery to change the rotation at a younger age, it may rebound or come back and it's still evolving and changing. So it is possible to change an internal tibial torsion. We do it some of the time, but most of the time it's, it's not necessary. And if you do it, it's a pretty big surgery. So moving up the, the leg a little bit higher. So we're gonna talk about femoral anaversion. So this is if intoing is coming from the thigh section. So the definition of anaversion is the angle of the femoral neck relative to the femoral condyles, which is down by the knee. Um, and you can see in this uh, cadaver specimen in the top right, the, the, uh, the femur bone on the right is less anaverted than the one on the left, the one that's pointed more straight up in the air because of that rotation within the, within the bone. And you can kind of see in this picture on the bottom left how you can, uh, how you can imagine how this would cause someone to into because if, that, if you have excessive antiversion and you want to make the hip kind of point deeply into the socket, in order to do that, you have to kind of point your toe in. And again, this, like all the other components of rotational alignment, evolves over time from infancy uh, through childhood. And this tends to get gradually less from the time you're an infant. 
up until around age eight or nine. And in most cases, in kids that come in, uh, they're four or five years old with femoral antiversion, it's resolved spontaneously by the time they're eight or nine years old. On exam, and this is very common, uh, kids with a lot of femoral antiversion t may prefer to W sit more than other kids. I often get the question of, does it matter if they W sit? I think it's a little bit chicken or, or the egg, in my personal opinion. Uh, I think it's probably that kids with a lot of femoral antiversion like to sit this way because it's comfortable rather than sitting this way causing femoral antiversion. So there's, there's some debate on that, but it, what is clear is kids that have a lot of femoral antiversion do like to sit like this. Uh, and because the, the thigh section is rotated in, the kneecaps tend to point towards one another. And on this prone exam, the legs, the hips spin in, which is this top picture with the feet pointed out. So that is a lot of uh, hip internal rotation, meaning that the kid likely has some excessive femoral antiversion and the internal rotation is proportionally more than the external rotation, which is in this bottom picture. Similar to the internal tibial torsion, uh, we, we watch this because it may improve, and even if someone has a little bit of more than average femoral antiversion, it doesn't tend to cause functional disability, it doesn't make you have hip arthritis or lead to long-term problems. Uh, so it's rarely needed to be treated surgically. However, if it does need surgery, then that is possible. In severe cases that are, you're always tripping over your toes because of dramatically uh, more than average femoral antiversion, or a lot of times people are, are concerned about the way it looks, which is a reasonable concern in kids and family members. Uh, but again, to fix it requires a surgery where you cut the bone, you spin it, you lock it in place and with a plate and screws or with a rod that's inside the bone. So it's not a small thing and it can have problems such as the bone not healing or infection. Uh, so it's not something you want to go into lightly, especially if a large component of the concern is, a, is the cos cosmetic component of it. Um, then I would certainly consider, and we often do here at Scottish Rite, consider preoperative psychology evaluation to really make sure that this is the, the right thing to do if we're going down that, that road. So let's move on to out towing, which in my mind is, is, tends to be worse overall than in towing uh, for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about. Again, we can kind of look at age groups and things that tend to be more common. Thermal retroversion in infants, and as we get towards adolescence, skiffy, which we're going to spend a decent amount of time talking about because I think it's it's really important. So on history, you know, they this is what you'll tend to hear without towing is my kid clips their heels together when they're running, they trip trying to get to first base, playing T ball or baseball, they walk like a duck. And my child hates to run, but it's a really good swimmer, and, and I think that uh, I've seen this. A uh, fair bit. You know, the in towers tend to be faster sprinters if it's relatively mild in towing and very athletic. Out towing gait doesn't tend to help you with your with your athletic skill, especially running. Um, so, but that's that's okay, and we'll talk about it a little bit later because you know ev not everyone has to be a marathoner, um, and it's just a type of normal. And again, there's a big range of of normal. Uh, variance in terms of some people point in a little bit, some people are straight ahead, and some people point out a little bit, and all of those things can be normal. In babies, oftentimes when they're born, they have a lot of femoral retroversion, especially you see this in preemies uh, that come in and, and the feet are pointed out, but this twisting outward of the femur bone tends to improve on its own without doing anything. And oftentimes what I see is kids that come in around the age, they start walking because they're, they're out towing or maybe they do it more in one leg than the other. And a lot of times this is in kids that actually have normal rotational profile to their bones, um, but they may turn their, their foot out as they're learning to walk just because their coordination isn't that great. They're learning how to do things and turning the foot out tends to give them a little bit more stability in that. Uh, that goes away on its own. And that's something you can easily reassure the parent if they have a normal physical exam. So unlike the W-sitters, 
children with a lot of femoral retroversion, it's easy to sit, sit cross-legged and because the hip in externally rotates more than it internally rotates. Femoral retroversion rarely causes long-term problems. However, it may potentially dispose, predispose patients to developing skiffy, which we're going to talk a little bit more about in, in a few minutes. Um, and it can be corrected with, with an osteotomy very similar to femoral antiversion where you cut the bone, you spin it, and you lock it in place. It's just spinning it the opposite direction, but it's, it's rarely needed. External tibial torsion, so this is in the lower leg section between the knee and the ankle. Uh, and instead of the bone being twisted in, it's twisted out. And you can see in this bottom graph how that also tends to change over childhood with it gradually becoming more turned out over time and then kind of levels off by mid-childhood by age kind of 9 or 10. Uh, and again, you can see the fairly big range from 5 degrees internal to 30 degrees external. I think it's always a good idea to check the foot, especially as kids are getting a bit older, because if you have a really flat foot, if you have a tarsal coalition and abnormal fusion of the bones in the foot, uh, then when kids stand, their feet tend to turn out, and that is in the foot itself rather than the lower leg, and it's important to differentiate between the two. And similar to internal tibial torsion, with external tibial torsion, it's possible to change it in those rare cases where it's a very severe deformity that's causing a limitation. Uh, with surgery by cutting the bone and, and spinning it and locking it in the new position. Generally speaking, this is in, in patients with a, a minimum of about 40 degrees external tibial uh, torsion before you start thinking about this or before it becomes a big enough problem to, to do that. Uh, and, you know, again, even if you're outside the range of normal, usually you don't have to, to do surgery or that type of thing. For example, my wife, her, her excessive external tibial torsion is about 60 degrees, and she didn't know it until after we were married, and she's fine. So not every kid, even if they have a lot of uh, excessive external tibial torsion, do you have to rush off to do a surgery if they're not having any, any symptoms. So I'm going to spend a decent amount of time talking about slip capital femoral epiphysis because it's something that is, A, very important. B, it's something that, especially if you're a pediatrician, uh, that, that's going to come into your office and it's very easily missed and it's very important not to miss it. So this is a condition of the hip and people often describe it as the ice cream falling off the cone. It's basically a stress fracture through the growth plate at the top of the femur and it can start to move out of position and similar to the ice cream falling off the cone it can just move a little bit or it can fall away all the way off and as uh, you can imagine if it's falling all the way off it's more severe cause causes more problems but you don't want to miss any of them uh, it happens during adolescence and you have displacement of the top of the femur bone the epiphysis on the metaphysis through the growth plate like a stress fracture it can cause hip pain or knee pain, uh, so this is very important to know. We'll talk about that a little bit more. It tends to make you turn your feet out, so that's partly why it's in this talk is because it can be a cause of out-towing and is the, probably the most important cause of out-towing not to miss. Um, so the feet turn out because of the way that the femoral head is moving on the rest of the bone when it slips out of place. And it, unlike many of the other things that we're talking about, is not benign. It can definitely cause long-term problems and short-term problems as well. We tend to see this again in adolescence. We tend to see it in kids the vast majority of the time that are overweight. And that is the biggest risk factor. It can happen on both sides. And epidemiology varies by your race, sex, and geography. It's highest in Pacific Islanders and African Americans. And as the obesity rates increase over time and continue to increase, as you can see with this, uh, with this chart from looking at 1985 to 2010 in the US, uh, we're only going to see more and more of this. And unfortunately, we see this quite commonly. And we see it quite commonly where it gets missed because it's hard to know what's going on. It doesn't always point right at the hip. So this is very important. They can, because of referred pain, a child with a skiffy, 
may only present with their foot turning out and mild pain, or they may come to the doctor's office saying, my knee hurts, the front of their, their anterior distal thigh, and that's referred pain. People will x-ray the knee and never think about the hip, and it gets missed and gets missed for months and beca can become a much bigger problem. It can move more out of position, become more, much harder to fix, and cause other long-term problems. Uh, and again, they tend to walk with their feet turned out. So if you have a kid that comes in and says, my foot has gradually been turning out over time and I'm 13 years old, that's not normal at that age. So if it's doing that, you have to, that skiffy radar needs to go off immediately. And the other important thing to know about the, these kids is it's not just their orthopedic issue. They often, they have higher rates of hypertension, sleep apnea. So they have a lot of uh, potentially uh, significant medical comorbidities that, uh, that I think as orthopedic surgeons we look at, but it's also very important for pediatricians to look at and, and deal with. Uh, it's important to know the difference between what we call a stable and an unstable skiffy. Stable basically means they can walk on it still. In that case, the risk of AVN, which is the, the blood supply to the top of the bone being affected, which can cause it to collapse over time, is, is very low. But if you have an unstable slip, which is basically like a true fracture, like a femoral neck fracture where the bones are moving around independently of each other and they can't walk, um, that can really increase the risk of, of damage to the blood supply, it tends to be more shifted out of place, and the AVN risk in some studies has been as high as 50%, which is definitely a big, big problem. So. If you see an overweight adolescent with an out towing gait um, and pain, you definitely think about Skiffy. You have to x-ray the hips, and if you diagnose one, you know, call us. We're happy to talk about it. Don't let them walk on it. Don't send them home. They need to go to the hospital. They need to have surgery to fix it because that's how we, we deal with it, um, and we don't want it to get worse. So if it's if it's more of a mild, stable one, we usually can just put one screw across. If it's unstable, the bones are moving around. We generally need to put two screws. This is a bit of a controversial topic because it's so out of place. Do you do a really huge surgery at the beginning to try and get it lined up perfectly with potentially higher problems, rates of problems with the blood supply? Or do you kind of lock it in place where it is and then you know, watch it over time? That's it's, uh, a topic that is, is still ongoing, but they definitely all need surgery. And oftentimes they actually need surgery on the other hip as well. Because as I mentioned, this can happen in both sides uh, about 25% of the time. And if they're younger, if they have more growth left, that is more likely. So there's different things that we can do to kind of predict what the likelihood of a child getting a skiffy on the other side if they've got one on, on the side they're presenting with. And in many cases, we will put a screw on the other side to prevent a skiffy from happening if they have a high likelihood of developing uh, a, a one in the future. And again, so looking at long-term outcomes, if it's a mild skiffy, they may do pretty well. Um, but oftentimes be, you can't line the bone back up perfectly without risking damage to the blood supply. So these uh, kids can develop arthritis, hip pain, cartilage problems over time. AVN is the blood supply problem that we mentioned. And this is, I think, really concerning and important. And if any of you pediatricians out there have a good uh, idea how to combat this, you know, please you know, let me know. But this is a, a long-term 20-year follow-up study out of, out of Scottish Rite uh, looking at, at patients who had skiffies in adolescence and how are they doing 20 years later. They had much higher rates of diabetes and hypertension than the national average. But the really shocking thing to me is that 20 years later, so these, we're talking about people in their 30s, uh, have a 10% mortality rate. So, and, 10% of these kids are going to be dead 20 years after their skiffy, and that, that's got to change, you know, somehow. I don't know how to do it. You know, I talk to every family that comes in with a kid with a skiffy about losing weight and trying to, to be healthier. It's very difficult for, the, for those habits to change, but it's uh, something we need to keep working on for sure. And here's a, a quick case example. 
um, that's pretty typical for, for Skippies that we see. It's an 11-year-old girl that came in. She'd had hip pain for six months um, and not gotten this figured out. Uh, and then she fell in PE, and now she had, went from having a stable Skiffy to an unstable Skiffy. And you can see in her left hip how it shifted more out of position, but she's got it on both sides. We took her to the OR. We fixed the side that was stable with one screw, the side that was unstable with two screws. Um, and, it, and it gently lined up a lot better, which is a good sign for her. Uh, we saw her for three months and then she disappeared, which is, I brought this one up because this is also a common story with, with Skiffy patients. For whatever reason, uh, they don't tend to follow up. And, uh, and again, they, they can have significant long-term problems. So this, this condition, again, the, my take home for you guys is uh, if you see these kids coming in with their alto and gait and pain, you need to, to jump on it and, and make sure it's not a skiffy. And if it is, then you know, we need to, to see it um, because it, it certainly leads to long-term issues. And then the last rotational thing that I'm gonna talk about here is what's called miserable malalignment. Fortunately, this is quite rare. Uh, my wife does have this as well, but in addition to her external tibial torsion, some patients also have that combined with excessive femoral antiversion. So they may look like this picture on the left, where standing, their feet are pointed straight ahead, but that's really um, because they have deformity that are uh, opposite and uh, canceling each other out at different levels. So their thigh section turn in a lot. You can see the kneecaps pointed in on the left. But if you point the kneecaps straight in, then their feet point out because they've got both. And this tends to be a little, fortunately, again, quite rare, tends to be more likely to cause knee pain or other issues as well. So probably more often treated surgically than kind of your isolated in-towing or out-towing. All right, so we're going to move on and talk a little bit now about our angular limb deformities. So genovalgum is being knock knee, genovarum is being bow-legged. And I think the most important thing here is just to understand kind of the natural growth and development in kids. Um, so most babies are born being a little bit bow-legged. Um, and then over the first year or so of life, that gets gradually less. Most families tend to notice it the most when they start standing and walking and they notice the bow-leggedness. And then they gradually become more knock kneed over time. And you can see in this kid, you know, 14 months, they're bow legged. At 25 months, they're pretty straight. And then they're kind of knock kneed, you know, when they're three. So understanding this kind of natural progression and being able to educate families about it, I would say for most of the concerns, is able to just. Uh, Similar to the in-towing and out-towing with education, you're able to kind of work through this, and oftentimes they don't need treatment. However, bow legs is one that sometimes does need to be checked on, evaluated, and treated. Uh, there are certainly some conditions that are less common, infection, trauma, various metabolic bone diseases or skeletal dysplasias because of growth plate injury in the case of infection or trauma, or an unhealthy growth plate in terms of these skeletal dysplasias and, and metabolic bone disease that can cause bow-leggedness, usually that's something that is already known about uh, from a standpoint of the patient's medical condition. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about those. Uh, we're gonna talk more about uh, the more common things we see, physiologic genovarum and Blount disease. Those are the two most important ones to differentiate between. So you might look at this case in the picture on the left. This is from our textbook again that there's no way this is gonna get better on its own, right? Well, this kid had no treatment and it got better. So this is, granted, this is kind of an extreme version of what we call physiologic genovarum, bow-leggedness that's normal and gonna get better on its own, but it can happen. And how do you tell the difference between the kind that's gonna get better on its own, the physiologic genovarum and Blount disease, which won't get better on its own? So typically, the physiologic genovarum oftentimes are presenting in, at age one, um, if you get an x-ray, it looks normal, and, but when they're younger, you can't tell the difference between Blount disease and physiologic genovarum on x-ray. Blount disease is more commonly unilateral. When they walk, they have a lateral thrust, meaning it tends to, their leg kind of scoots out to the side at their knee when they, when they walk, and it may run in the family. Um, but again, remember, that with normal alignment, uh, by age two or so, kids should not be bow-legged anymore. 
So if they are, that's really a good point to, they need to get in to see an orthopedic doctor because they could have Blount disease. When do we get x-rays? You know, if we see, if there's something like a family history or another risk factor, they're worried about it, um, or metabolic bone disease or skeletal dysplasia, we certainly do. Rarely do I get any x-rays before age 18 months because you can't tell the difference. Classically, this has been uh, radiographically described, and that's how you make the diagnosis of Blount disease, and you start to see these changes over time. But again, you don't really start to see these changes until around age two, so it's something you, you may have to just watch and see if it's going to develop. If it turns out to be Blount disease and you see a Blount uh, lesion, a sick growth plate of the proximal tibia on the x-ray, we know this will lead to gradually worse and worse bow leggedness and it needs to be treated. It's usually just on one side um, and they're, they're usually big kids and they may have a family history. But again, it's hard for us to make the diagnosis uh, before age two to three, um, but it's something if you're concerned about it, they definitely should get in to see us. Historically, uh, these were treated at a young age, often with bracing. And this is the type of brace that kids wear that's on the left. I will say it's very hard if a kid has it on both sides, which happens to wear, get them to wear a brace on both sides. They don't like to do that. Um, and if they're young enough, this can sometimes work. But if they're getting older, it's not going to work. And historically, we did surgeries where we cut the bone and reposition it, and that can help correct it. But as time has gone on, we're treating more and more of these with what's called growth modulation because it's less, uh, it's a smaller surgery than cutting the bone and locking it in a new position. And basically what you do, if you have a bowed tibia like this picture on the left, you put a small plate with a screw on either side of the growth plate to tether the one side. And it doesn't straighten it right away, but over time as the kid grows, it can let the, the leg grow into a straight position. And then you take the plate out. Um, so this, in my mind, is, is my go-to in terms of mild to moderate cases of Blount disease and infantile Blount disease, rather than cutting the bone uh, entirely, the osteotomy. And this is just another, this is a, a newer classification that was uh, really helpful in terms of guiding treatment that uh, one of my senior partners helped develop. And basically, if you're looking at the bone and you can see this little, you start to see changes over time and you get a lucency within the medial proximal tibia, you know it's Blount disease. And, uh, and that gets more abnormal over time. If you see the little ski jump upslope, does it hold water? Uh, then the, that usually means it's going to not always come back and you have a good chance of success. If it's very severely sloped, then we tend to not do as well and tends to come back. Um, and so older kids can get it too, what we can call late onset Blount disease. And sometimes this may be an infantile Blount disease that was missed, especially if they show up at age five and they have it. But you can also develop it at an older age. When you develop it at an older age, the, the, the epiphysis, the top of the tibia bone, tends to look more normal. It's more common in African-American males. And almost all of these kids are very overweight um, and definitely usually in the obese range and sometimes very significantly obese, as you can see here from this study where they exceeded the 95th percentile weight for an, by an average of 43 kilograms. So in these kids, even if they present older, similar to infants or toddlers, excuse me, uh, these may correct with growth modulation. So you put the, the plate, little plate and screws to tether the growth plate, and then you watch them over time. And you can see like in this kid, it gets straighter and straighter. And eventually you can take the plates out and make the legs kind of grow straight like in this kid here. Uh, but that doesn't always work. If the deformity is severe or you can have issues where the screws break, and then what do you do? So this is a case example that, that's fairly typical uh, where you see in this kid, she was seven, she was quite large. They tried, they tried to do growth modulation to correct the leg, but it didn't work. The screw broke. It's hard to see in this picture, but there's a broken screw there. And so next you have to do even bigger surgery. So then this is the, our next kind of way we usually go with gradual correction in a frame. So you cut the bone, 
you put a big external frame on there, and then you gradually change the, the angle over time. And by doing this, you can make the legs straight, but this is oftentimes still not even the end of the story. You have to watch these, these kids as they grow, because like in this kid, that left leg did fine, but then she comes back a few years later, and now her right leg's starting to be bow-legged. So um, and now she's having surgery there. So it's, uh, the, this is a difficult condition, and similarly to Skiffy, it's one that is often associated with obesity and significant obesity and likely leads to similar long-term problems and probably even, I, I would, I, it has, hasn't been shown for sure, but I, I would, uh, I think that the likelihood that the mortality rate in these kids is maybe even higher than the Skiffy kids if you looked at their 20-year mortality. So it's a really big deal. And, you know, managing their obesity and hypertension and sleep apnea and all the things that go with that are also important in, in addition to treating the orthopedic disease. Lastly, we're going to talk about uh, genuvalgum or knock knees. Um, and similar to bow-leggedness, you can have other conditions, systemic conditions like rickets, trauma, osteochondromas that, that contribute to this. Um, which we're not going to talk in detail about today, but certainly if they have any of those things, other conditions, you're aware of them and you treat them appropriately. Uh, like this kid with, uh, with a metabolic bone disease, and you can growth modulate and get them to grow straight. Um, but especially if they have skeletal dysplasias or, or metabolic bone disease, you have to kind of keep an eye on it because one leg may be fine and then the other leg may, may start drifting and you may have to treat that. So. Uh, but it's something that, that growth modulation can still work on. For typical, the typical knock knees and genovalgum that we see, when should you send them to see us? If the family is, is worried, we're happy to see them at any point. Um, but as you can see here, you know, most kids have some knock knees and genovalgum that peaks around age three. And so if you can kind of walk through uh, the normal development with the family and let them know that, hey, this is normal to be knock kneed at this age. It's going to gradually improve up until you're eight or nine years old. You know, if they get to this part, this flat part of the curve and they're still significant, like knock kneed is probably not going to change at that point, And that's a really good point to see us. Similarly, with treatment, you know, bracing these or is not going to make them better. But you definitely, and this is a real thing I found on, on, on Amazon, you know, there's there's definitely people that will sell you, you know, booklets or programs to, to try and cure the knock knees, but that, that doesn't really work. This is a structural problem. The bones are, are not lined up well. And if you have too much genovalgum, then really the only way to fix it is with surgery. And that depends a bit on age, you know, and how, how severe the deformity is. If you have mild genovalgum, that's quite common. That's not likely to cause any long-term issues. But if you have severe genovalgum, then that may cause con uh, both A, a cosmetic concern, um, and B, can probably lead to some uh, functional problems, uh, such as uh, an OCD or osteochondritis desiccans, which I'll, I'll have a slide on here in a minute. This is something my sports partners see quite frequently. For, create, for treating uh, genovalgum, it's, it's relatively simple if they're still growing. I know we talked a bit about growth modulation so far, but like this kid, if you draw the, the line from their hip down to the ankle, especially on this left leg, it passes way outside the knee joint. They have a lot of knock knees or genovalgum, um, but they have it on both sides. You can, because their growth plates are still open, you can tether the growth plate and gradually grow them straight without cutting the bone, and then you take the plates out. And you can see how over time the screw is actually kind of spread apart, and that's showing that it's kind of tethering the growth plate. And you'll see something like this if you if you go in there or look at the X-ray. It kind of it tethers it, but the screws kind of move apart. If the growth plates are closed, you can still fix it, but it's a lot bigger deal. You have to kind of cut the bone and, and take a wedge and open it up, or or close the wedge on the other side to kind of recorrect the, the or to correct the angle. Um, and certainly can be done, um, but it's a bigger surgery. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier, so OCD, so having a problem at the end of the bone that, or that you have a soft spot in the bone, something my sports partners often see. Um, there's been some literature that shows some correlation between uh, alignment, either being bow-legged or knock-kneed, and, uh, and where the OCD is. So sometimes 
we will correct the angle of the bone at the same time my sports partners are doing a procedure to help treat an OCD. So to finish up, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, just when, in summary, when we should be concerned and when, uh, when patients need treatment and need, need referral to an orthopedic surgeon. For in-towing, again, I would say the take-home message from this is it's very rare that it causes a problem. This is also a study out of our institution that took a bunch of kids that came to see us with in-towing, and only 1% of these, nine, only 10 out of 926 kids ended up having something that wasn't just benign in-towing, um, such as uh, CP is, is the most common thing we see in that case. So. Um, some kids already had a known diagnosis, and that's something that, that we should be aware of. But the vast majority of the kids that come in for in-towing aren't going to need any treatment, aren't going to need surgery, don't have any long-term issues. Uh, that being and said, as we mentioned earlier, it's important to educate the family and walk them through it, reassure them, help them understand the natural, hitch, natural history. Because sometimes, for like in this study, um, they'll still kind of come back, you know, to, to check even when everything is, is normal, and that's okay. We're happy to see them, but I think education is the biggest take home here. For out towing, most of the time it does not cause long term problems, but a little bit more than, than in towing does. It doesn't really need bracing. Um, if kids are older than eight and they're having significant functional or cosmetic concerns, we definitely should see them. And then, again, be aware of the things to look out for for Skiffy because that needs surgery and that causes long-term problems and we don't want to miss that. Bow-leggedness, genovarum, you know, that is more often going to need something than some of the other conditions that we've talked about. If it's a young kid, oftentimes and most of the time it's physiologic genovarum that's going to get better on its own. Uh, but it, it can be Blount disease. Uh, it can need treatment, and so especially if a kid is older than t is two, they turn two and they're still bow-legged, I definitely would want to see them. If they have asymmetric bow legs, or you know, if you have your obese adolescents with, with a new or, or progressive deformity, definitely need to see those. Or if there's pain, you know, because if there's pain, that may mean there's a problem with the cartilage, like an OCD or something else going on that we need to, to treat. So if you've got pain or, or knee swelling, then definitely we need to see those, those patients. And then gin valgum, and most commonly it's physiologic. And if you have a mild gin valgum, it's not gonna cause a problem. It's gonna improve throughout childhood until eight or nine years old. Similarly to bow-leggedness, if there's pain, swelling, or severe deformity like this kid, then that's probably gonna need treatment. We definitely should see those kids. It's safe to wait until without severe or progressive deformity, certainly until age eight or nine, if family is comfortable to see how it is developing before, before seeing them. But again, we're happy to see them any time if parents or, or uh, referring providers are concerned. Surgical erection is pretty straightforward. If the growth plates are open and it's still possible, but a little bit more difficult if the growth plates are closed. And here's some of the references. And I appreciate uh, being able to, to talk with you all, got all of you that are going to watch this on, on video. And certainly if there's questions in the future, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to talk anytime. Thank you.